turn to the passage that was read from the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. Now, the book of Revelation is, of course, a difficult book. It is a book filled with visions and symbols and pictures which are not always easy to understand. Nevertheless, even the book of Revelation has straightforward parts, especially the first three chapters. In chapter 1, it tells us how John was imprisoned on the island of Patmos. It is generally agreed that this took place when John was a very old man, the last of the surviving apostles. And on a certain Lord's Day, Christ himself appeared to him in a vision and gave him seven messages to be sent to seven churches in the province of Asia Minor. And then in chapters 2 and 3, we are given the content of the messages themselves. Although there is symbolic language within the messages, yet these messages really were sent to seven literal churches and they deal with real literal problems in the lives of those churches. Now, today is... Reformation Sunday. 499 years ago, as at tomorrow, Martin Luther posted his 95 theses on the door of the castle church of Wittenberg, and that became a tremendously significant event in the subsequent reformation of the church. And as we think today about church reformation, we cannot do better than to look at the words of Christ to these seven churches. May God grant to all of us to hear and to understand and take to heart and to see the relevance of these things for our own church here in the 21st century. Well, we begin with John's vision. In um, John, sorry, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. John heard a voice like a trumpet saying to him, what you see, write in a book. And John turned round and he saw seven golden lampstands. And there in the middle of these lampstands, there was one like the Son of Man. It was the Lord Jesus himself appearing in glory. And in his hand he held seven stars. And his countenance, his face, was like the sun shining in its strength. And John, the beloved disciple, John, who had known Jesus through his earthly life so intimately, John was overwhelmed with the glory of the Son of God. And he says, I fell at his feet as one dead. But Christ lays his hand upon him and says, do not be afraid. And he tells him to write what he sees. And then he tells him that the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. 
It does not seem probable that we should understand these as being heavenly angels, but rather as earthly angels or messengers. Because the ordinary um, meaning of the word angelos in Greek, it is either a heavenly angel or simply a messenger. And Hendrickson says this, he says, angels must be taken in the sense of pastors, ministers. The Lord holds them in his right hand. He exercises absolute authority over them. They are his ambassadors. He protects them. They are safe when they obey him and are faithful in his service. And the seven lampstands, John is told, are the seven churches. Christ's people are to be the light of the world. And each of these individual congregations is pictured here as being a lampstand, holding forth the light of life in this dark world. Now, this vision speaks to us about the relationship between Christ and each local church. What we are being shown here is that the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, the one who died and rose again from the dead, the one who lives forever and has the keys of death and hell, this Lord Jesus is personally involved in the life of each one of his churches. That is why he is seen in this vision walking among the golden lampstands. He is present with his people. He is present with each one of his churches. He holds their messengers, their pastors, their teachers, he holds them in his hand. It is Christ who gives pastors and teachers. It is Christ who takes them away. And he knows each of his churches. As we read the, the letters themselves, we have this constant refrain, I know your works. I know your works. The Lord Jesus, glorified in heaven, knew everything there was to know about the church of Ephesus and the church of Smyrna and Laodicea and these other churches. And he knows everything there is to know about CREC. He knows us through and through. He can say to us, I know your works. And he not only knows, but he sits in judgment upon the works of his churches. To Tyatira, he says this, I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. To the church in Sardis, he says, I have not found your works perfected before God. He knows, he assesses, he judges, he controls the circumstances of these churches. To Philadelphia, he is the one who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. See, he says, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. It is Christ 
who opens doors and Christ who closes them. It is Christ who determines the circumstances of his congregations. And he reproves and he corrects them. He warns them against continuing in disobedience even to the extent of warning that if they will not listen, he will take away the lampstand. What does that mean? They will no longer be a church. They will no longer be the light to the world around them. They will be taken away, removed from being a congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even more graphically, he warns the church of Laodicea, if they will not repent, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That is strong language. I wouldn't use that kind of language in the pulpit, but it's here, it's the words of Christ. I will vomit you out of my mouth. You make me sick. That is what Jesus is saying to this congregation. And they must listen. They must heed. He not only reproves and corrects, but he also makes gracious promises if they will listen. And he expects the obedience of his churches. He commands them to repent. He commands them to remember and to do the first works and so on. And he expects obedience. The church is under authority. Do you remember the words of Paul in that passage that we so often read and preach on at weddings? Ephesians 5.22 Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. And he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. How is the church to be governed? It is to be governed in strict obedience to Jesus Christ its head. The churches are not to be governed according to human wisdom, personal preference, human expediency. They are to be governed according to the revealed will of Jesus Christ recorded in the scriptures. Well, we go on to the first church, which is um, to the angel, the messenger, the pastor of the church of Ephesus. Ephesus was the largest city in Asia Minor. It was the administrative centre of the province. The church had been founded by the Apostle Paul and it was now the foremost church in the Eastern Empire with the possible exception of Antioch. The church at Ephesus was sound in faith and it was actively doing the right things. It was watchful against error it was persevering and it was diligent, but it had lost its first love. Does that refer to their love for God, for Christ, or does it refer to their love for one another? We don't know, but what we do know is that the two are inseparably linked. Love for God and love for the people of God are found in the same persons. And they are aspects of that love which God puts in the hearts of his people. And because 
they have lost their first love, for that reason the church is exhorted to repent and it is warned that if it does not repent, Christ will remove its lampstand. It will cease to be a church. Despite its orthodoxy, its sound doctrine and its diligence, Christ will no longer recognize it as his. It's worth observing in these seven churches that there are only two churches which are threatened with anything as drastic as that. And in each case, it is because of inward attitudes. It's not because of outward sins. It is because of the lack of love, the loss of love in Ephesus, and because of the sheer complacency and self-satisfaction in Laodicea. And these two churches which are accused of these inward dispositions, they are the ones that are threatened that if they do not repent, they will cease to be churches. We're reminded that Christ does not judge as men judge. The Lord looks upon the heart. Man looks at the outward appearance. Well, what is the church to do? Well, like the church in Sardis in the next chapter, it is exhorted, first of all, to remember. Verse 5, remember therefore from where you have fallen. It had not always been like this. The church had known better things. And the first thing was to realize that. As uh, the writer to the Hebrews exhorts the Hebrew Christians, call to mind the former days when you were first enlightened. Call to mind, remember, the love of your youth. Remember from what you have fallen and repent. Turn around, change. None of these letters is written simply to condemn when Christ reproves his people. It is not for their destruction, it is for their repentance and for their radical transformation and reformation. We are reminded that repentance is not only for unbelievers. Repentance is for believers. Repentance is for churches. Repentance is for pastors, for elders, for deacons, for church members. Repentance is a lifelong activity. We sometimes sing the hymn, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Well then, if that is true, if that is our ongoing experience of being prone to wander, we must also be prone to repent. We must be constantly living a life of repentance until we come to glory and are no longer prone to wander, no longer prone to leave God. Until that time, we must live lives of ongoing, repeated constant repentance and he says repent and do the first works repentance is not simply an inward experience it's not simply inward remorse it is a change of heart and a change of direction Christ calls upon these people to recover what once they were and he warns them with this dire warning that if you will not do it, 
I will come quickly and remove your candlestick from its place. Now, we must be clear about this. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall never prevail against it. The Christian church as such will never be overthrown. The universal church will not be defeated. But local churches very often are defeated. Local churches are often overcome and cease to be true churches or cease to be churches in any possible sense at all. We must not apply what belongs to the body of Christ, the universal church of Christ on earth. We must not apply that to ourselves and say we can never be overcome. If we will not heed the voice of Christ, it will not be long before we are overcome and before our candlestick is taken away. What about those who do respond? Verse 7, To him who overcomes I will give to eat from the tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God. Spiritual blessing. That is what being a Christian is about. It's about spiritual blessing and spiritual fruitfulness. That is what the church is to seek. We come on in verse 8 to the church at Smyrna. Now, Smyrna today is the second largest city in Turkey, but its name is now Izmir. In the second century AD, Polycarp was its bishop. Now, Polycarp was probably the last surviving person in this world to have known a living apostle. He had been a disciple of the apostle John. And then John had lived a long life, and Polycarp lived a long life, and so he became the, the last survivor who had known an apostle personally. He was put to death for his Christian faith as an old man. On the day of his martyrdom, when he was invited again, he was invited to renounce his faith and to save his life. He said this, 86 years have I served him and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king and my saviour? And he died for his faith. It's not clear whether he was 86 years old or whether he was older than that and had been a Christian for 86 years. But you see, even at the time that, that Christ is addressing this church in Smyrna, much, much, much before Polycarp's day, even at this time, the church had suffered persecution and it was materially poor, possibly because of their faith, but it was a church that was spiritually rich. Christ speaks no word of criticism, no warning, no call to repentance. For this church of Smyrna, there is only encouragement and the exhortation to continue faithful unto death and he will give the crown of life. What can we learn from Smyrna? I think the most basic thing to learn here is that it is possible. It is possible to be a church which fully pleases Christ. Christ is not a harsh taskmaster. He says himself, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
he is not unpleasable and the church in Smyrna was pleasing to its Lord its head but we must be obedient we also see here of course that faithfulness and pleasing Christ does not exempt anyone from persecution and from suffering in verse 10 you will have tribulation indeed the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life they were a faithful church and yet they experienced suffering and persecution faithful Christians are not exempted from all kinds of trials and problems and then notice also thirdly that worldly status is irrelevant to spiritual fruitfulness this was a church that knew tribulation and it knew poverty and it knew Christ's blessing at the same time by contrast we see and we see even in among these churches that many are wealthy prosperous church churches of rich businessmen and the like have lost their way spiritually there is no necessary correlation between worldly status and spiritual status here is a poor church but rich in faith and in pleasing Jesus Christ well then we come on to the churches the next two churches are Pergamos and Thyatira and these churches serve to warn of the danger of tolerating error both doctrinal and practical now Pergamos Pergamos the city was the seat of the imperial government and it was a city described as being given to idolatry more than all Asia behind the city there was a 300 meter high hill which was covered with pagan temples and Pergamos was the recognized center of emperor worship in Asia with a temple built for the worship of Augustus and the goddess Roma it was also a center to which people came from all over the world to be healed by the local god I, I, I kept trying to practice this it's um, a difficult word to say Aesculapius yeah, with the god Aesculapius and his symbol was a serpent and taking these things into consideration it's easy to see how Christ says to the church I know where you dwell where Satan's throne is and yet in the midst of all this worldly power and pagan religion the church had been faithful even in times of violent persecution even when one of their members Antipas had been martyred for his faith but where the church failed was in dealing with internal error it tolerated some holding the error of Balaam the doctrine of the Nicolaitans we needn't go into detail as to what these were but the point is they were errors which ought not to have been tolerated and Christ warns them that if they do not repent then he will fight against them with the sword of his mouth they will have more to fear from the sword of Christ than from the sword of the emperor 
and then there's Tyatira, the smallest of the seven cities. This, an industrial city, renowned for its many trade guilds. And this was the problem. You see, these trade guilds would have periodic meals with food dedicated to some pagan deity and then very often the meal would degenerate into an orgy of immorality and debauchery. But here was the problem. It would be difficult to succeed in business without belonging to one of these guilds. And you see how the temptation was there to the church to compromise and the compromise arose out of commercial interests. We must do it for the sake of our business. We must do it in order to succeed. Now Christ commends the church in many ways. Its works, its love, its service, faith and patience and its growth. He says its last works are more than the first. And yet there was a certain tolerance of things almost certainly connected with these trade guilds. There was a certain Jezebel probably not her real name. She's probably called Jezebel because she was like the wife of Ahab who led Israel into gross idolatry and wickedness. This Jezebel called herself a prophetess. It's clear that Christ did not recognize her as a prophetess just as there are many today who call themselves prophets and prophetesses who are not recognized by Christ or recognized by sound biblical Christians as being prophets or prophetesses. But this prophetess, so-called, was leading people into idolatry and immorality. And the church ought not to have allowed it. And Christ himself now says that he will exercise judgment upon her. The church should have done it, but the church has failed to do it. He will exercise judgment upon her and those who follow her, and her judgment will be an example and a warning to the other churches. But as far as those who have stayed clear of these things is concerned, Christ lays no further burden upon them, only hold fast, continue unto the end. Well, what do these two churches, Pergamos and Thyatira, say to us? They remind us of the danger of tolerating what must not be tolerated. The error of Balaam, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, the teaching of this woman Jezebel. It seems to me that if you want to be faithful to Christ in the present generation,